Cool. Um, so I'm going to talk about Webpacker, uh, and that means I'm going to talk about Webpack a little bit. I apologize in advance. Uh, no, it's be great. Uh, this talk originally was inspired because Miles wanted somebody to explain Webpacker to him, and then he didn't show up. So uh, you guys, you guys get the uh, the brunt of, of his failure. Uh, so there we go. Cool. All right. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, Webpack to start. Uh, you know, kind of compare it a little bit. You know, this is the Ruby meetup, so you guys are probably more uh, familiar with the asset pipeline in general. So kind of a little bit of compare and contrast with the asset pipeline. Uh, maybe to start, who out here has used Webpack in some capacity? Actually, okay, it's a decent number. Uh, who's used Webpacker? So fewer, but some number. Okay. So most of you are probably like me, where uh, you saw something like you know cool new tool like Webpack, uh, and you saw that you know DHH was still like JavaScript is dumb and no one should ever use it, and uh, so you kind of rolled your own and said, okay, yeah, it's great DHH. Um, but now uh, they've gotten on the train, so now you can use Webpack officially. Uh, so yeah, when might you use it? Um, you know, like uh, not every you know in the same way that. Not every single app requires Rails, or not every single website that you build requires Rails. Like maybe you don't need Webpack. Uh, there's some complexity that comes with it. Uh, it's really powerful, but uh, great power, great responsibility. Something, something. Um, so what is Webpacker uh, specifically? And then I put together kind of a pretty simple Rails example that shows off some of the features of Webpacker and uh, that kind of model. So. A uh, little bit about me. Uh, so I am working on a new startup as of like a week ago. Uh, so that's me. Uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I'm an excellent rubber duck. If you're ever stuck on something, uh, feel free to explain it to me and you will solve it without me saying anything. Um, that's the rubber duck theory. Uh, I've been doing Ruby for a while, React for a while, uh, Webpack for a little while as well. Uh, I actually gave a talk about three years ago at NDJS on JavaScript package management and uh, build tools. So um, this was kind of the landscape at the time. Uh, there were a handful of tools out there. Uh, we were using one called Browserify. So Browserify is sort of like the Unix philosophy uh, built, you know, package manager for JavaScript. Uh, it's a lot of, you know, middleware that you're sort of combining into a tool chain. Uh, different philosophy. Uh, Require.js was kind of one of the early, uh, you know, the early early horses in the race. Um, a lot of the Salesforce and Exact Target stuff that they were building was using Require.js. Um, that uses a format called Asynchronous Module Definitions, AMD. Um, and there's another format called CommonJS, which Browserify and Webpack and most of the other ones use that at this point kind of seems to be what's winning out. Um, Node uses kind of a version of CommonJS. And um, so pretty much every package you see these days that's been written in the last few years uses CommonJS. But uh, you might see some that use this kind of wacky AMD format. Uh, JSPM was one that was kind of like getting hot at the time. Uh, it was kind of this new, different thing. And then uh, that has an underlying build tool called System.js. Um, if you've done anything with, I think Angular uses System.js under the hood, if I remember correctly, like if you use the out of the box Angular stuff. Um, so JSPM was actually like a competing package management system as well. They had their own repositories and everything. Um, that piece of it I haven't seen take off as much, but System.js uh, still seems like it's sticking around. Uh, and then Webpack was just like this weird German thing uh, at the time. Uh, like it was like you know a handful of people using it. There was a guy working on React called Pete Hunt, or named Pete Hunt, who um, was like blogging about this thing and like trying to translate the docs or find people to translate the docs from German because it was just some weird side project of this this one guy in Germany. Uh, and now it's like the thing that Facebook uses to build everything. Um, so uh, it's come along quite a, quite a ways over the last few years. Um, and even at the time, it was sort of like the super powerful thing that nobody could quite understand. Like it was enabling all of these crazy superpowers for front end engineers. Uh, but it was really, really finicky and hard to get it going. Um, so I'll kind of dig into that a little bit more. So this is you know, from the Webpack website, but what is it? So you know, modern web applications, uh, especially front-end apps, you know, it's not just a bunch of JavaScript and a bunch of CSS and a bunch of, like, everything's sort of dependent. You've got these dependency trees. Um, and so Webpack, what Webpack does is sort of traverse all of your dependencies uh, and produce sort of sensible bundles that um, you know, group similar things together, group things that are used at the same time together. Um, there's a couple uh, kind of good illustrations of this. 
uh, coming up. So I, I found this video as I was digging around. Uh, probably the best version of a talk I could give is just having us all watch this video for the next 15 minutes, but unfortunately you're gonna get me instead. Um, but I would recommend this video. Uh, it's from a group called frontend.center. Um, and it's a really good kind of illustration of, you know, kind of taking a simple HTML. This one's not actually tied to any specific framework. Um, they just take HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and kind of incrementally refactor it to use Webpack and sort of explain the trade-offs of, uh, you know, the download sizes in the browser, the download speeds, you know, what things block on other things in kind of a traditional web application. So really good kind of like basic overview of the performance considerations around JavaScript, CSS, uh, images, those sorts of things. Um, so there's a couple of great illustrations from this video. Um, so they talk about, you know, this is kind of the grunt gulf, uh, you know, asset pipeline view of the world where you've got a bunch of JavaScript, a bunch of CSS, and a bunch of images. Um, and it processes each one of those sort of completely independently. Um, and the way that Webpack views the world is a little bit different. Um, so it sort of views the world as this, this tree, you know, of here's an entry point, which might be a JavaScript file. And that JavaScript file depends on other JavaScript files. And some of those JavaScript files have icons or images or other assets in them. Uh, maybe it depends on CSS. And that CSS depends on other CSS. Um, so it sort of creates this, you know, uh, internal representation, this tree of how all of your assets are related to one another. Um, and then that allows you to, to do some interesting things down the road, like maybe these things can be bundled independently of those things, and you can cache these things differently than these things. So uh, as you kind of get into more sophisticated applications, um, the standard kind of, you know, asset pipeline view of the world of here's a bunch of JavaScript, a bunch of CSS, and a bunch of images, like this JavaScript might depend on this image and this CSS file, but I've got to load all of those things all at the same time, or I've got to kind of manually uh, manage my assets. Whereas with this kind of more intelligent view of the world, um, you know, I can sort of let the package manager or the, the bundler, the module bundler, uh, be smart on my behalf. Um, it seems like, you know, uh, everyone is trying to let computers be smart so that we can be dumb. Uh, and Webpack is certainly leading the trend, uh, at least for me. Um, so I also stumbled across this, uh, I don't know how many of you have ever run across a Giles Balkett blog post. Uh, he's a bit of a firebrand on the internet. Uh, but he made this little graphic here of, uh, you know, how does Webpack compare to Sprockets? So Sprockets is kind of the underlying technology under the asset pipeline. Um, and, you know, uh, so Webpack has some of these, you know, kind of interesting things that I'll talk about. So tree shaking uh, kind of helps you eliminate uh, paths in your code that might not be used. So dead code elimination is another way that tree shaking is described. Uh, huge ecosystem. So Webpack has like, you know, it's been around for two or three years or something, and it has, you know, 400 contributors and 33,000 GitHub stars and whatever other kind of vanity metrics. You might want to use Sprockets. You know, has been around for a decade, almost I don't know, six, seven years, and it has like you know a hundred contributors and four hundred stars on GitHub. It's like uh, just kind of there. Every, nobody likes it, but what are you, what are you going to do, right? Um, so, uh, you know, Webpack, like I said, kind of has this different view of the world, um, and of course the you know tongue-in-cheek part is it can never catch up to JavaScript. So there's actually a project right now to rekindle uh, development on Sprockets. I think somebody gave a talk at the last Rails Conf to sort of drum up interest and in kind of taking another pass at Sprockets. Uh, curious to see where that goes, but it's possible that sort of Sprockets was a product of its time uh, and, you know, is ready for something new to come along. Um, but sort of just a little, you know, little overview. The one downside of Webpack, at least here, is you know you kind of have to start getting your hand. You have to install another dependency. You gotta at least you know know a little bit about kind of modern JavaScript. But uh, the trade-offs seem to be worth it in a lot of cases. Um, so what are some of like the cool features of Webpack? I've sort of alluded to them. Uh, so code splitting is one, right? Being able to sort of take these monolithic trees of dependencies and split them up in interesting ways. Um, so you know we had. Uh, like a vendor bundle, for example, that had code that was used across all pages, and then we had one that was maybe only used in certain subsets of the application, and then one that was feature specific. Um, so we could only, you know, we could load only subsets of our code on a particular page pretty easily. Um, and also let Webpack be intelligent about breaking that up for us. Um, we just sort of had to tell it what, you know, like um, here's an entry point, factor out the code that's common, and it can actually, you know, run some algorithms and tell you, like, okay, 
these things should belong together, these things should belong together. Um, the tree shaking stuff I talked about, uh, that pairs with a tool called Uglify in this particular case to do, you know, like you might import a whole library, but only 20, you know, you're only using two functions out of that library. Normally you kind of have to make this trade off of, is it really worth the additional overhead of importing this library just for those one or two functions? Um, you still may like at a, you know, code quality level want to make that assessment of whether or not it's worth pulling in a library, but uh, you no longer really have to worry as much about whether you're pulling in, uh, you know, an additional cost to your payload, like doubling the size of your payload just for a couple functions because Webpack can look at it and say, oh yeah, you're only using these two functions. We'll just uh, strip the rest of it out. Uh, hot, rod, hot module replacement is like the greatest thing ever and also like the most frustrating thing ever. Um, so hot module replacement, uh, so you know, uh, many of you might be familiar with hot reloading where you make changes to your code and it automatically refreshes the page, um, you know, full page reload. But if you're testing a long form or something, right, and you're trying to edit the fifth field in the form but it doesn't show until you fill in the second field, um, you know, you end up kind of running through the cycle over and over and over of typing and checking and then reloading the page and typing and checking. Uh, hot module replacement can actually swap out the component that you're working on live without reloading the page. And if you've structured your application correctly with something like React um, and your state is kind of independent from your uh, UI state, um, you can actually like type in a form field, it'll reload the component and then re-inject the data that you had in that form field. Um, so you can kind of rapidly iterate on whatever you're working on. That's super cool. The super frustrating part of it is like, uh, I don't know that I've ever worked in a system with hot module replacement that like didn't break periodically and then I had to go figure out why it broke. So um, it's probably, I mean, it's definitely getting better, um, but uh, there's definitely some frustration with it. Um, dynamic imports or something. So you can actually say, uh, you know, in the same way that you can require uh, a bit of code, you can actually require a bit of code asynchronously, like at runtime and say, go out to my server, fetch this bit of code. And then when it loads, almost like a you know, it uses promises uh, JavaScript um, to then actually you know use that library and execute that code once it loads. So that's another way that you can kind of shave off um, you know bundle size and only load something if a particular function actually gets called. Um, and then there's some pretty cool like bundle analysis tools. So you can take your Webpack assets that have been generated. It'll generate JavaScript files. You can upload them into an analyzer on the Webpack website, um, and it'll actually break down like what all is in that module, what's big, what's slow to load. Um, we used this to debug. Um, we were trying to do some code splitting and it wasn't quite working out uh, exactly the way we expected. And we were able to see that certain modules were getting included in multiple bundles and that kind of allowed us to track down uh, the code splitting issues we were having. So that's just kind of part of the community around Webpack. Um, you know, as it's kind of become more popular, some of these secondary tools have, have sprung up and make it um, much more productive. Um, and it kind of does all the classic asset pipeline stuff too, right? It packages, it transpiles, uh, all those things. So, uh, so when should I use it? Um, so I think there's kind of two schools of thought here. Uh, the you know, uh, you know, the JavaScript hype train is going to say like you should always use Webpack. The asset pipeline is dead. Uh, you know, don't cling to the sinking ship. Um, you know, Sprockets is buggy, uh, managing CSS at scale without any kind of like sensible dependency management is just a nightmare. Uh, ES6 is great and allows you to sort of split your code up more intelligently without having to use, uh, you know, ifes or whatever, IIFEs, the uh, in instantly invoked function expressions, whatever. Um, so like, you know, the package net or like the way that Explicit imports work in modern JavaScript is just really powerful. Uh, Yarn, the new package manager that kind of replaced NPM or is parallel to NPM, uh, is pretty incredible. And asset precompilation is always that thing that takes like 10 years uh, to when you're deploying a Rails application at scale. Uh, Webpack seems to be faster um, at compiling bundle things. Um, I think you know the other school of thought that I kind of alluded to is like you know if you're just doing some JavaScript sprinkles. Uh, all of this is un unnecessary. Um, so like Basecamp, you know, they've sort of famously been on the, you know, you don't need a front-end framework. Um, all you're doing is taking some HTML and just dropping in little bits of JavaScript here and there. 
Um, as far as I know, they have not adopted something like Webpack at Basecamp. Uh, just no need for it in their architecture. Um, so you know, if you're kind of comfortable with sort of the classic Rails approach, you're not using a modern framework like Angular or React, or even if you are using it, you're only kind of dropping in components here and there and not writing your whole front end in it, um, you know, that's probably fine. Um, there's kind of a convention over configuration. Uh, so Webpack like requires a pretty significant amount of configuration out of the box. Um, you know, like, uh, so if you're kind of just want to get off the ground, get something going, if you're building a prototype, um, maybe it's not worth it. Um, and then, yeah, if, if you're working on like, you know, a really complex advanced Webpack configuration, uh, it's just like a gigantic, you know, one gigantic file. You can split it up a little bit, but um, again, I think it's been, it's gotten better. Like Webpack 1 was really hard and the docs weren't there. Now it's on, I think, Webpack 4, if I remember correctly. Um, and it's gotten way better. Um, but so you may not need it in every case, you know, uh, we're, you know, not going to cut you out of any future JavaScript conversations just because you haven't used Webpack. Um, the asset pipeline is still perfectly fine for a lot of applications. Uh, so then what is Webpacker? Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen this IAM developer account, but uh, a year ago, just throw a bunch of Babel plugins. So Babel is kind of a, you know, transpiler from TypeScript or ES6 into kind of whatever the browser understands, older versions of JavaScript, ES5, et cetera. Um, so for a while, we were just kind of throwing Babel plugins at problems and hoping it would fix it. Uh, and that led to this kind of exchange here. Of, you know, you spend two days, you got a Babel config, you're feeling pretty good. Uh, and then now we're here in 2017, we figured out Babel, but uh, <laughs> we got 30, 35 steps to build a simple JavaScript app. Um, so, you know, I kind of mentioned the configuration over convention of Webpack. Uh, Webpacker is kind of the Rails flavored Webpack, right? So it's uh, bringing that convention back into it. Uh, so out of the box with Webpacker, uh, it's built in, like there's a generator, uh, or you can add it as a gem um, to an existing Rails app. But you know, you get environment specific configs for you know, the con you know, dev test and production. Um, you, know, you get uh, cache busting, so you get the automatically generated hashes on all of your assets and everything out of the box, which you have to configure yourself uh, on a standard Webpack setup. Uh, you get Babel and ES6 kind of out of the box. You get uh, loaders for CSS and SAS and images and a handful of other things out of the box. Um, so it adds this new directory, and I'll talk about the directory structure in a sec. Uh, oh, actually, I think that's singular, not plural now. So we can all go home. This talk was terrible. Uh, I pluralized JavaScripts. Um, so, but, uh, so it creates this new directory, and any JavaScript files you put in there become these kind of top-level entry points, jumping back to that slide way back, where there was the one JS and then the tree underneath it. Um, so anything you put in this packs directory, and that's where your major modules would go. Uh, so maybe you have an admin module, and you have a, you know, login module, and you have a payments, you know, whatever you're building. Um, those would kind of be there, and then you would refer out to uh, whatever director structure you want in the, the just app JavaScript. Um, so there's built-in generators for React, Angular, Vue, and Elm. Sorry, Emperists uh, in the room. Um, maybe there's a plugin for it. And then you get some kind of Rails helpers so that you can quickly uh, drop in these uh, Webpack bundles. Um, so there's a one thing that's kind of quirky about this. Um, it's either good or bad. Is um, there's sort of a DSL that gets introduced that's like a YAML-based. Uh, configuration. So if you do need to make some small tweaks to the Webpack config, but you don't really want to like jump into the whole big thing, um, you can kind of use YAML, which then generates JavaScript, which then actually config. You know, like it's this uh, sort of uh, indirection layer. Um, so that's either a good or bad thing. Um, and then you know, also this sort of puts uh, your client directly into your Rails application, which depending on the structure of your team, depending on you know, whether or not you're planning on building a mobile app, any of these kinds of things, um, it might actually make sense for you to have a stronger client server separation. And then maybe you do want to kind of bring your own Webpack to the table instead of relying on something like Webpacker. 
Um, so I'll kind of walk through, I, I put up like a just trivial, put together a trivial Rails example. So use the generator to build a trivial Rails app, kind of walk through the directory structure, just added, added one plugin, added a couple other little things. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of show that off real quick. So, uh, um, and this is available. There's a GitHub repo, I am Chipstar. Uh, this is the Webpack So Good project. Um, so let me find this. Oops. Other way. There we go. All right. Uh, this is my kind of little control center here. Let's uh, see where I've ended up. All right. Um, so basically, what I've done here is um, just generated the basic project, uh, and then um, it by default creates a. Here, I'll, I'll pull this over here. Um, so by default, in that app JavaScript pack director, packs directory, it creates a hello react.jsx file. Uh, JSX, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with React, and I just chose React here as an example, but you can use any of those other frameworks or just vanilla JavaScript. Um, so JSX is sort of this language that React uses. Um, it basically compiles down to JavaScript under the hood. Uh, it's HTML with a bit of magic. Um, to be able to kind of inject JavaScript into it, so give or take. Um, so this is kind of the hello world React component that gets dropped in here. Um, and then just for simplicity, um, you know, I created a, a route to application index.html.erb, um, and then you drop in this one little tag here to make this a little bit bigger. Um, so this is the job, there's a JavaScript pack tag and a style sheet pack tag, and those refer to the outputs of Webpack. Um, so basically what happens is uh, this gets compiled by Webpack um, into you know, a standard ES5 output for the browser. Chrome in some case you know, can understand some of the ES6 stuff, but um, it gets compiled down. I'll actually show you real quick um, if I pull up the network tab. Here, so you can see there's you know, an application.js, application.css, all the kind of standard stuff. Um, and then there's this new hello react.js. Um, there's a you know cache cluster hash attached to it. Um, this is kind of the output of oh god this thing is this file is actually pretty big um, because it compiles a bunch of uh, React stuff into it. But uh, basically what it does is uh, native JavaScript at least in older browsers doesn't understand import statements or requires it or anything which um, if you look here, this is importing. So this is the new ES6 uh, import syntax. Um, this is importing other JavaScript. Um, React and React DOM and prop types are all um, you know, library functions, um, but you can also import your own. Um, and I'll kind of walk through that here in a sec. Um, so most you know, older browsers don't know how to, they don't understand what import means and they'll throw a syntax error. Um, so what's happening under the hood between Webpack and Babel is it's transpiling this from ES6 into ES5, bundling it up with the dependencies, and then creating one JavaScript output. Um, and that's kind of what we saw wherever that went. There was a thing here. Um, it's made too big. It's too big now, yeah. Um, so if I kind of uh, walk forward a little bit, uh, let's go to the next commit. Let's see if this guy will reload. I might need to reload this page. I think I need to reload this. Um, so what I kind of did in my next commit, um, oh, I uh, skipped this up here. That's why that wasn't working. Um, so basically what I did was um, I just moved, I created this new components directory here, um, and I created a hello react, you know, and put my index in here. So I basically just, um, started to kind of build up a component tree because of, like maybe this is the hello world module and there's going to be eight or ten JavaScript files in it. We don't want each one of those to result in a separate bundle. Um, those are all kind of part of one module of my application. Um, so anything that's in this PAX directory gets its own module. Um, and then what you typically do um, is you just kind of create this lightweight, you know, import whatever module, like whatever the head of the module is that you want. Um, and then those just kind of live in the standard app JavaScript directory. Um, so if I walk forward one more. 
All right. Um, the other thing I did along here is um, I'll show you it's my Webpack config. So in um, config Webpack, um, there's an environment JS, which is sort of shared between all the environments. And then you get a dev production and test. Um, so if I pull up the development one, I'll make this a little bit bigger. Whoops. There we go. Um, so I added a new uh, JavaScript package here, and this is actually using an NPM package. Um, so using yarn, um, you can. There's a command called yarn add, uh, similar to npm install, um, and it'll automatically add it to your package.json file. Which there's now also a package.json file in the root of your project. Um, so here I added this dependency called webpack dashboard. Uh, it's a dev dependency, so that means it's not actually used in live runtime code in production. It's only used when I'm developing on my local machine. Um, and that gives me just kind of a cool, uh, this cool little like command center. It makes me feel like I'm living in the future uh, and that I'm good at programming. Um, and that actually kind of shows like, um, so I, I, right here I'm running two things. I'm running a Rails server um, and I'm running a Webpack dev server, which is what uh, would get you some of the hot reloading or the hot module replacement and things, um, although I didn't configure that for this. Um, and then this little thing basically just hooks into the output of my node dev server. Um, and it's giving me, you know, what are kind of the core modules that are there. Um, on this screen size is hard to see, but I can actually see uh, what bundles it's producing, what the size of each one of those bundles is. Um, it tells me whether or not there are any errors detected, so I can go track those down. Um, and so all I did basically was add that to my package.json, and then in my configuration here, um, this is kind of that like little intermediate DSL that I talked about. So this is in Ruby, um, but it's importing from this environment file, uh, which is importing this kind of special Webpacker uh, JavaScript code. Uh, and then what I did is I said I wanted to add a new plugin. I gave it a name. I called it the dashboard plugin. Uh, I imported it from the node module, uh, and then I injected it into uh, the Webpack configuration. Um, and then this, uh, there's this command to convert from uh, a JavaScript structure to an actual Webpack config object. Um, if you're more kind of familiar with JavaScript, um, you can also do this more advanced. Like you can actually just merge exports together um, in a more traditional way. Um, but this is sort of this little DSL that Webpacker added that if you're just doing a couple little tweaks, might be easier than learning the whole Webpack config. Um, so that's all I need to do to drop that plugin in. You know, if I were dropping in a, another node module, basically once it's in there, I can um, require it or import it. Um, require and import are effectively the same. Uh, imports actually get converted into require statements. I used require here because that was what was came out of the box, and I don't know if Webpack is set up to evaluate its own config as transpiled output or not. So, um, so if I kind of walk forward, see what I did here. OK. I, there we go. Um, so basically what I did was, um, if I go back to my uh, Hello React component, um, so I expanded it out a little bit. I made this class called Big Div. Uh, there's another one called Big Div Dark. Um, and what you can see here is also I'm importing an SCSS file. Um, so uh, the Big Div is actually defined in my uh, application.css here. Um, but the Dark is defined in a local uh, SCSS file here. Um, so by default, or so this gets imported, this CSS actually gets kind of injected into the overall style sheet, and then the style is applied. Um, the way that I have this set up now, um, I also, in our index.html, added uh, a big div dark to see if the CSS that I had imported locally would be applied to this element or not, since it's actually outside of the Webpack bundle. Um, what you'll notice is, uh, it is actually sort of leaking that context when I import it in CSS. Um, so there's some tools that you can use here, like there's something called CSS modules that allows you to sort of scope it to, um, it'll basically generate uh, custom class names or dynamic class names on the fly and only apply styles for that specific class. So you can do 
some more interesting stuff like that. Um, but this is just kind of a simple example of importing uh, you know, uh, a CSS file from JavaScript. Um, and so then this file, like if I'm on a page where I'm not evaluating uh, or I'm not using this hello react class or component, uh, that file will never get loaded. So it's not you know, polluting my overall style sheet on every page. It's only if I load it, uh, it kind of gets injected. Um, so the next thing I did here uh, was I added this, I added another uh, pack here, another entry point called counter.js. Same setup here, I'm just creating a new counter component, um, counter JSX. Um, and here I'm also creating just a plain old JavaScript file. And this is a really dumb implementation. Um, basically I just made a store, uh, it has a counter, and then it exports a few functions that I can call. Um, and I can increment or decrement uh, or return a value. Um, so, but just to kind of show that I can import from another another JavaScript file as well. Uh, so if I go to slash counter, uh, oh, all right, let me restart this real quick. Um, so I, I ran into a couple cases when I added a new entry point um, where I did need to restart my uh, Webpack dev server here. Um, I don't know if that's something that with a little bit more time I could clean up, but hey, there we go. All right, so uh, it starts at zero. I can you know increment and decrement it. Um, I can also change the steps that I want to go by and go six at a time, plus or minus. And this is just you know the world's dumbest React app, but just kind of showing that you can import uh, standard JavaScript or other React components from uh, one React component here. Um, and that's all handled through Webpack. Uh, if I keep going forward, uh, so I, uh, this is not yet an enterprise React application, so I needed to refactor my simple buttons into like a custom stepper class that I created here. Um, you can set louder. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Ooh, interesting button style. Um, so here I just made it so that, you know, I changed the step here um, and, you know, this button does the same thing as before, but now it's kind of dynamic based on the step. Um, and really what I want to show off here was just so I can import a, a React component in addition to just a simple JavaScript component. So this is one React component importing another one. I didn't need to change anything else about the Webpack config there. If I keep going forward, Um, so by default, um, there is uh, an image loader built in. So if I go here uh, to my counter, um, I am importing uh, an image from a local path, uh, and then I am displaying that image down here. Uh, basically, the source gets set to the actual image that I've imported. Um, and you can actually configure it so that it, like, depending on how you have your image config set up, you can say if it's less than 1,024 bytes, automatically compress it into a byte string. Um, there's kind of some optimization things that you get out of it. Um, so here I imported a GIF. Uh, you're welcome. Um, so yeah, so there I was able to just kind of import an image and then use it directly as the source uh, of an image tag. Um, and that was again not you like didn't have to go through the asset pipeline at all for that. That was all controlled through Webpack. Um, if I keep moving, uh, so the next thing I did here was oops, break this. Oh, I'll probably need to reload again because in this commit I um, actually went into the config. Uh, so I had to do a couple things here. So one, um, so I added a markdown loader. Um, so in addition to kind of the out-of-the-box ones that you go with Webpack, there's also a whole sort of suite of other ones that you can import here. Um, so I got a markdown loader and then an HTML loader because markdown gets converted to HTML, which then I want to use in React. Um, so from there, uh, I then had to tell, Mark, or tell Webpack how to actually do anything with that markdown loader. Um, so again, back in my sort of development config, um, this one's a little bit more complicated than the previous one. Um, so basically what I did is said, you know, I want to create a new loader for Markdown. I'm going to call it Markdown. Uh, basically anything with an MD extension 
uh, I want you to put through this chain. Um, there's a there's multiple syntaxes for this, which is part of the like Webpack config can get clunky. There's a simpler way where you can kind of chain multiple loaders if you don't have any other options. Um, but here, like the Markdown loader actually has some options available that you could pass it. Um, the simpler syntax, um, if I remember correctly, is something like uh, you can do like HTML Markdown, or I think it would be the other way around. Um, and basically what this says is when you find a Markdown file, put it through the Markdown loader, then the HTML loader um, before you give me the asset. Um, so you can kind of chain those together. Um, so then if I go back here, um, so in my component, sorry to jump around a little bit, um, I created a new just sample.md file here. Um, and I also created a github.css just so the markdown would look kind of like GitHub flavored markdown. Um, here I imported sample. Um, one thing you'll notice here is that I did have to pass the extension on this one. Uh, so Webpack, when I add the loader, uh, it knows how to handle that extension, but it doesn't know that it should automatically in, like read the extension and then do something with it. Um, so I just wanted to kind of show this as like, um, if you run into trouble where it says, hey, I don't know what to do with MD, like if I get rid of my MD here, um, Webpack will yell at me uh, and tell me that it can't resolve dot slash sample because it doesn't know, like it tried to look for dot slash sample dot js and dot jsx and dot ht, like it tried to look for everything it knew how to load and it didn't know how to load that. Um, so, but now I'm back in good shape. Um, so I imported a sample markdown file and then, you know, um, through a little bit of React trickery, um, I'm easily, to, you know, so it loads from the file system and it renders in the browser. So that's kind of how you add new loaders. Uh, into the pipeline. I believe that was the last thing I did. Okay. Yep. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like a quick whirlwind overview of like what you get out of the box and then um, kind of some simple configuration, you know, how you can kind of get started with it. So let me find my mouse. All right, um, and that was pretty much it. So, questions? Sorry, I know that was kind of a lot to cover. Yes? Did you show how you actually used the imported markdown file and sample? Sure. Um, yeah, I was trying to avoid kind of digging too deep into the React side of things here. Um, so I, I think there's actually like, um, there's a library called React HTML Loader that will actually generate, um, it'll go from markdown to HTML to actually stateless React components. Um, what I did for this one, um, so React has this method, uh, which you have to be very, very sure that you're calling because you have to jump through hoops, called dangerously set inner HTML. Um, and then, uh, so it's this really quirky syntax, so they really want you to know that like you're doing something bad and you shouldn't be doing it. Um, so this is your punishment, as you have to type out this. Um, so basically it loads in, like at this point I have an HTML string um, when it goes to the markdown and the HTML loader but I could chain another loader on it and then it would actually get a component that I could render directly in line. So, yep. Yes? Um, do you have any tips or tricks for navigating the Webpack documentation? Because in my experience, it's rather useless. So um, still have to run <laughs> uh, that's a good. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think a lot of the time you can find other people's examples um, out there. I think that's usually a good technique. Um, the documentation is definitely getting a lot better. Um, this is also your chance to be an open source hero. Uh, Mitch Hanberg, Elixir uh, wizard. Um, Mitch had a blog post featured on Elixir newsletter recently, so he's kind of a big deal. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I think kind of find, finding examples is usually a good one. Or, yeah, if you kind of see something that you think could be a little bit more clear, if you fight through it, um, you know, like I said, there's, I don't know, 400 some contributors to the core Webpack uh, project at this point. They seem fairly open to uh, contributions and pull requests. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, I have a question if you have with uh, Rails 5.0 Webpacker and after that, I'm in the bucket of like always use Webpack. But I'm 
not sure what to do with old apps that are still using sprockets and there's a ton of JavaScript in that ecosystem. Uh, do you have any advice for if you wanted to try to convert an app? Uh, is there an easy way to do that? Uh, I guess it depends on your definition of easy. Um, you know, for the guy who has taught himself, uh, you know, data science and Ruby, um, you may have a different definition than other people. Um, so what we did, we actually converted a Rails front end, like kind of a classic, you know, asset pipeline front end, incrementally to uh, React. Um, and the way that we did that was basically imp we started implementing new functionality um, using. Uh, you know, React components and things. So, like, if we were building a new page, we would put a top level React component in there and start using Webpack for that. Um, from what I've seen, uh, you can, and from like our experience with Webpack directly, but I think also with Webpacker, uh, you still have access to the old JavaScript include tag versus JavaScript pack tag. Uh, so, the two systems can actually coexist. Um, so, that was, that was probably our best approach was. Um, using it for kind of new functionality or picking off small, you know, low-hanging fruit that we could rewrite all at once. Um, but yeah, we were able to kind of navigate from one to the other. We did things like um, passed in, you know, uh, you know, we used like the, uh, you know, asset pipeline generated images and passed those in as props to our React components when we were first starting out. So we, you know, if it was an image that was used in a whole bunch of places. Um, so yeah, you, you can definitely kind of, um, you know, mangle it a little bit. And I won't tell anybody. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're actually doing a very similar approach to that using Webpacker in a Rails 4 app mm -hmm. um, alongside a lot of the JavaScript stuff that's still in the asset pipeline. We just essentially hook into, well, Webpacker automatically bakes into assets pre compiled and just runs the Webpack build stuff as well. Um, so essentially, all the new stuff is in Webpacker and it's all React and the inbox. And, Lord knows what our front end devs are doing. Um, <laughs> one other thing when you're working with, like, where it's not just you're doing the whole thing, but you have like front end and back end sort of separation a little bit, is lots of times front end folks don't like the asset pipeline, don't want to mess with any of that stuff. You can change what directory the webpack stuff lives in. So ours lives in app front end, um, yeah. and they get their own sort of playground with packs and stuff. Yeah, I, I think we did the same thing. Um, we created a separate, for ours it was Webpack, and other projects I've used slash client, you know, just like create a completely separate uh, parallel structure for, you know, here's what a front end lives. Um, and then, you know, part, part of that for us was, you know, we wanted to be able to reuse that front end down the road, and, you know, we ended up reusing pieces of our front end, drop, like dropping it into Salesforce uh, mysteriously. Um, we, uh, you know, we're also kind of gearing up for potentially a React Native app in the future, and so like having those components separated out, maybe even a little bit more than a classic Rails application was sort of the direction we took. But again, that was also just you know the state of the union two years ago when we kind of started that. So um, yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, you talk about how like, Webpack is smart so that you, know, you can be done. So yes. Thank you. Uh, are there any like, it doesn't make any, are there any tips for like, still like helping with back to this job and how you structure your files or is that not even like some good work? Yeah, yeah, there's, there's definitely, um, especially in kind of earlier versions of Webpack, um, I actually, I don't even think I'm fully up to date on like what's new and Webpack 4 and stuff. So um, yeah, there were definitely places like when we were doing our code splitting, um, you know, we had to um, do a bit, you know, a bit of work to kind of get that working the way we wanted it. And like I said, there were certain, uh, you know, like gigantic library imports that were getting uh, included in multiple files. So, like we, you know, we split out. I think it was basically like three tiers of JavaScript, um, and you know, React was getting included in two of those tiers, and it was like, you know, uh, unminified, you know, 500 kilobytes or something. You know, so like our total payload size at one point I think was like 36 megs or something stupid. Um, not, you know, like in production, but. Um, so, but some of those tools that I mentioned, like they, um, I think it's, it's like analytics or analysis.webpack.com or something, if you just look for like Webpack Analyzer, um, you can actually take, there's like a JSON manifest that Webpack creates, you can upload that in the analyzer. There's some like eye candy uh, that gives you this, you know, moving image of like all of your modules and, you know, looks like you're looking at like a virus or something, but, um, yeah, um, that kind of helps, you know, you still have like, uh, we are not yet in a world where we can just kick our feet up and be complete idiots on the front end, so maybe someday.
Cool. Anything else? Anybody else? Cool. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much for having me. Thanks, Bill. Yeah.